I will hand it over to Stephanie Morris with RASI, Refugee Alliance of Central Iowa. And Ref Stephanie, do you want to uh, introduce your team and get started? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as Drew said, my name is Stephanie Morris, and I'm the director of the Refugee Alliance of Central Iowa. Um, if you are unfamiliar with, with Rossi, we are a collaborative of stakeholders who are vested in seeing uh, Iowa being a welcoming place to refugees and immigrants. So we work with um, all the different resettlement agencies, of course, um, as well as the different kind of state uh, departments of, um, you know, Department of Education, of Labor, um, of Justice. We work with a lot of the different health providers, mental health providers, employers as well. Um, anyone who wants to learn more about how to work with refugee communities um, better. So thanks so much for being here today. Uh, we're really uh, grateful to be part of this and to get this conversation going, especially to those that are maybe new to this space. Um, and then I will let Eva introduce herself as well. Okay, I'm Eva Carre, and I am with Catholic Charities in Des Moines. Uh, and I've been with Catholic Charities since um, September of last year. Thanks, Eva. Okay, so we have some information we've prepared for you all in a PowerPoint that we're going to go through with you right now. And then um, we'll have time for uh, a Q, that Q&A session then at the end. So, all right, and we'll Stephanie, go ahead and get... I might add to that if, if uh, people want to put their questions along the way in the chat box, Nicole will be moderating those and we'll do those at the end. Thanks very much, Drew. And thanks, Nicole, for doing that. That's always a fun job too. So I appreciate it. Okay. So just to start off, um, we wanted to be able to lay out a little bit better um, some information about migration. So we always preface conversations about refugee resettlement uh, just by mentioning you know, that, 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 that human migration has been going on in Iowa um, since, the, since the beginning of time, um, of, of human history anyway. So um, in our current space though, there's a lot of different um, definitions or, or designations that are used. And so just to kind of maybe lay that out a little bit easier, um, refugees. So a refugee is considered somebody who is forced to flee their home country. Um, that that, um, that fleeing is, is due to persecution, to war, to violence. Um, it can also be due to um, um, you know, climate change, drought, um, other weather events. Um, and the, the designation of refugee is actually something that is determined uh, by, by one international organization, and that's the United Nation High Committee for Refugees. And we'll talk about, a little bit more about them uh, here soon. The second thing, the second term that we wanted to, to, um, to share with you is an asylum or an, as, uh, an asylum seeker or an asylee. Uh, these are individuals who flee their home country um, and they seek sanctuary in another country and apply for asylum. And so one of the ways that I kind of break down the difference between a refugee and, a, and an asylee is oftentimes refugees are gonna be overseas. They're gonna be in, in, in another country where they're applying for that refugee status. Whereas an asylee um, is oftentimes applying for, uh, for that status um, either at the border or after they have already entered that country. Um, and then immigrant, uh, an immigrant is a foreign born individual who will voluntarily leave their country of origin and has been admitted to reside permanently uh, in another country. And then of course we have our special immigrant visas um, which are designated for people who help the United States military, such as Iraq and Afghanistan most recently. And due to that affiliation, they're not safe to stay um, in their home country. So a lot of times our, our SIV recipients will come through refugee resettlement agencies like refugees. Um, but that, yeah, that is a, a kind of a separate, again, designation. So just these words are used so often that we, and we will, um, we will be sending out an additional hiring guide and some other resources after today's webinar 
that will be able to further break down um, the definitions and uh, and the, the kind of hiring regulations and information around this as well. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Eva, and I did see that Laura, um, I'm gonna just pause really quick. Laura was able to, to join us this afternoon as well. Laura, are you able to unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Laura Thacko. I'm the Family Services Manager with Lutheran Services in Iowa, LSI. So we are one of um, the soon to be four refugee resettlement agencies um, here in Iowa. And then uh, we have a, a Des Moines office and then we have an office in Sioux City that opened this past year as well that is also doing um, initial resettlement and refugee services. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for being here. Okay, so then I'm gonna turn the next slide over to Ava and then we'll just rotate from there. Okay. I kind of did something in that last, the, okay, here it is, okay. Um, so there are 89.3 million forcibly displaced people um, and around half of those are, that are displaced are actually children. Um, of the 89.3 million, 27.1 million have actually have obtained refugee status through the UNHCR. And then uh, 4.6 million are actually um, asylees. And then out of the 27.1 million refugees in the world, less than 1% of them will be resettled in new homes, meaning um, uh, many people who live if uh, the duration who live the duration of their lives basically waiting to be resettled into new homes. Laura, are you able to unmute and do this one? Okay. Sure. So how does refugee resettlement work? So there is kind of a pipeline from overseas uh, for new arrivals. And so the United Nations, UNHCR, is they are the ones that actually give the refugee status to an individual. So um, once, they, once they flee their country of origin and they've crossed over um, country border, um, they'll apply to UNHCR for refugee status. And then UNHCR will provide um, what is supposed to be temporary shelter, although it can in reality, you know, folks can be in a refugee camp for, for decades or even their, their whole lives. And so um, these temporary shelters can, you know, turn into more like uh, small cities actually, um, but they have a food allowance and kind of the, the basic necessities provided for them. Ideally, um, you know, the, the first best option is that the conflict in their country of origin will end and they're able to return home. So obviously nobody wants to have to leave their, their home country. And so we can see like with Ukraine right now, for example, I think there's a little bit of a wait and see of, um, is the situation going to be able to be resolved so that, that, you know, Ukrainian refugees don't need to permanently be resettled somewhere else. Um, the second best option is that they would be able to integrate meaningfully into their, the country that they've fled to. Um, but if that's not possible, then kind of the last, the third and last option is, is resettlement in a third country, such as the United States. And the average wait time right now in a refugee camp is um, over 15 years. So again, a situation that is supposed to be temporary can often stretch into um, decades, unfortunately. And we have a lot of people that have arrived through the refugee resettlement program who have spent 10, 20 years in camps waiting. Um, how does refugee resettlement work kind of continued here? So many refugees don't have access to education or paid work opportunities while they're waiting in camps. Um, more than two thirds of all displaced people worldwide actually come from um, a like very small group of countries, five are listed here. So that's Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, 
South Sudan and Myanmar, which is known as Burma. Um, and this just as a heads up, so this data does not include the UNHCR data currently that we have does not include um, Ukraine in terms of the, the specific um, where people are coming from, where they're being, where they're being um, temporarily housed. So again, the top five host countries, Turkey, Colombia, Pakistan, Uganda, Germany, don't, that does not include um, those that have fled Ukraine. Um, and I would also say too, you know, our refugee camps oftentimes are, you know, also very vulnerable to other things. We had a, a fire um, in, in Bangladesh uh, last year that affected a really large Ro Rohingya camp. Um, we've had a, a civil unrest, civil war happening in the Tigray region of Ethiopia and, and thousands have lost their lives um, just last year alone. Um, around the world um, in these refugee camps just due to a lot of the vulnerability that, that people are, are subjected to. Eva, are you able to do this one? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, in May, August, August of last year, the Afghan government fell to the Taliban forces. So that means uh, 300,000 plus civilians were at risk of retaliation from the support uh, with 123,000 civilians airlifted out of Afghanistan into the US. Um, so the US has welcomed 74,000 arrivals um, as part of the Operation Allies Welcome. And I received a thousand of them. Um, August Afghan arrivals uh, through the Operation Allies Welcome program will be, uh, they usually will hold the SIV or humanitarian parolee visa status. And then um, resettlement processes for the humanitarian crisis is very different from the regular resettlement. Um, and I don't know if uh, you can explain more about that. Yeah, um, so, so with, 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 in, in the true nature of, of a definition of a humanitarian crisis, and I don't, I don't think that that designation was, was used lightly here. Um, things are, are constantly evolving, things constantly change. And so people arrived um, and immediate needs were addressed first. They came with a humanitarian, humanitarian parole, parole status. That was their visa status that they entered under. Um, and then um, there have been efforts to pass an Afghan Adjustment Act that could put these arrivals on those that don't hold an SIV visa, so everyone else, which is most of the arrivals, that could put them on a pathway to citizenship, very similar to refugee um, to refu to refugee uh, arrivals. Um, however, this hasn't passed, um, and instead, TPS or or temporary protected status has been approved for those uh, Afghans that have arrived since August. Um, and so we will have the, everyone that doesn't hold an SIV status, then that will need to apply for TPS and or asylum um, then in the next year. Laura, do you have any other information on that that you wanted to add in? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's just been a huge challenge with the Afghan program because of the way that the evacuation was carried out and kind of the lack of planning around that. And so we brought, you know, all these folks here to the US, obviously in a pretty compressed time frame, and um, without really a plan for them of legally, you know, how they would be able to stay here. So there was security screening that took place on the on the military safe haven bases that they first arrived to, um, but no clear pathway uh, to any kind of permanent legal status like we've done for, um, for other groups in the past, like Bosnians and um, people, you know, Vietnamese. Um, so it's really an ongoing issue and uh, very stressful for our Afghan, <clears throat> our Afghan clients and also just, you know, for all of us kind of walking alongside them here, um, trying to see what, what happens next. And I, you know, I would just, another thing I would add in with TPS, you know, we do have other communities that have been recipients of temporary protected status in the past, whose TPS status at just kind of at any time could be, could be changed. And they, um, you know, they're, 
there, there, there's there's no like clear pathway to citizenship there. So if there's a, you know a legal issue, you know they could be facing deportation. If the TPS status changes, um, their their um, their legal residency here could be at risk. So we are hopeful that the adjustment act, uh, the Afghan Adjustment Act or AAA. Um, we, we are hopeful that that does pass or something similar to it passes sometime soon so that this, that this um, you know, kind of loom, you know, very heavy looming fear um, can be alleviated from, from so many. Okay. Laura, I think you were up next. So a little more about the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, and I'm sure we've all um, been pretty aware of this as it's unfolded um, since August, really, I guess. Um, so UNHCR is now estimating that um, close to 13 million people have been displaced. So some of those have been who have been displaced are fleeing to neighboring countries, mainly Poland, um, some others as well. Um, but there are significant numbers that are what we call internally displaced. So they have been displaced within Ukraine. And, um, you know, as the Russian attacks have advanced in Eastern Ukraine, we see um, people fleeing to the West. And so they may not qualify for refugee status. They haven't crossed that international boundary, but they certainly are no longer um, able to be in their home and are in temporary, you know, shelter or different, maybe with doubled up with family um, in a different part of the country. The um, TPS status for Ukrainians, um, basically there is kind of a, uh, there were some U Ukrainians that have come through the Southern border. So, um, you know, looking for, um, for safety, there's also a private sponsorship program. And so this is a little different because um, Ukrainians qualify for some benefits through ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, so things like public benefits, cash assistance, um, food assistance, Medicaid, um, as well as some, some different kind of case management services potentially and employment services, but they do not qualify for initial resettlement services. So the things that we would typically do for a family when they arrived, um, these things are all um, being provided by a private sponsor. And um, yeah, the numbers, the numbers of arrivals from Ukraine are just, are really low at this point. And I don't know, Stephanie, if you know, exactly where we are, but um, yeah, the, the, the arrival numbers are, are very low kind of across the country. I, you know, there's, um, we have had some calls about it, but, but not in the numbers that you would kind of hope to see. Yeah, I think the the reports I've heard from the State Bureau of Refugee Services have been have been very very like just kind of family like a like a family here and there, um, and the reports coming like just nationally, you have to go through an I one thirty sponsorship application, and that um, that can be an intense process. So we know we've definitely heard a lot of both individuals and from organizations kind of around the country um, that that process can be. Um, very cumbersome to be able to get through. Um, so, yeah, we we don't see. I haven't heard of a of a of a um, expectation of having a large influx, but we I think that the plan is that um, most people expect kind of like that that slow trickle to to potentially continue for a little bit. But with Ukraine as well, I think again the expectation is that even for those that do arrive through sponsorships, they're going to be here for up to two years with. Um, with the plan in place right now is that they would return home after. So different than refugee resettlement where people resettle to stay in, in, in Iowa and the United States permanently. Okay. 
Um, so just historically, the United States has resettled around 100,000 people every year. Um, so this is what's called a presidential determination. It's a, the PD is determined by the president annually after consultation with Congress. We usually get that kind of in the fall. Um, and so then that's just the maximum number of people that will be allowed into the country um, every year. So there's nine agencies across the entire country that um, resettle refugees through, uh, through the refugee resettlement program in the United States. Um, and they work with the Federal Office of uh, Refugee Resettlement or ORR. So the ORR works with UNHCR to determine who comes here. The majority of people that come into the United States are considered uh, family tie cases. So my mom, I'm gonna bring her here or my brother, and then he might bring his kids later. Um, they're, they're not just um, being you know, randomly assigned to different places. It's usually family ties. And then refugees admitted into the United States are actually processed through one of the most intense uh, intensive screen processes that exist. Um, Ava, are you able to talk about the background checks that people have to go through and the screening processes? No. Laura, are you able to talk about this more? She may, we may have lost Laura for a second. I, um, Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah, the screening process, sure. So, um, I mean, I think in Iowa, there is kind of more of an understanding that refugees do have legal status. They have been thoroughly vetted, you know, prior to arrival in the U.S. Um, again, with the Afghan program, it's been, a, it's worked a little differently. Instead of being screened prior to arrival, they were screened after the evacuation on the U.S. military bases. Um, after they were already here, but um, refugees are the most highly vetted group of immigrants coming into the United States. And so this is just showing um, a list of all of the different, different federal agencies that are involved with all of those biometric biographic screenings that they go through, um, including in-person interviews and um, you know, a whole, a whole host of things, so. And that can take years. Yeah, and everything has to line up exactly right before they're um, cleared to come here. And so they have, um, you know, their background checks and security clearances uh, screenings, but then they also have like medical screening. And so all of these things um, have to happen within a certain period of time so that they're actually cleared for departure to get on the plane and, and come to the United States. And as you can imagine, if you spend 20 years waiting to come somewhere, things happen. So if you get married or if you have babies, um, that can obviously change the whole process too and take even longer. Um, Ava, would you be able to take this one? Um, yes. Do, uh, sorry, do we wanna take, are we waiting for questions until the end or do we want to? At the end, yep. At the end, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, after the fall of Saigon in 75, uh, the go Governor Ray convinced the press, uh, President Ford to accept 3,500 refugees to be relocated into Iowa and to keep these families together. So in 1979, the governor continued to, um, with the Iowa Global Humanitarian Leadership, uh, by asking them to bring 1,500 Vietnamese who are fleeing from Vietnam. Uh, Governor Ray went into, on to create um, Iowa Shares program, sending vital food, supplies, and medicine to people who are starving in Cambodia. Um, and then also his advocacy to bring refugees into Iowa began uh, what has been a long legacy of humanitarian leadership around the world. So over 40,000 people have been resettled in Iowa since 1975. Okay, um, so in Iowa, there are three agencies. So we have three of the nine refugee resettlement agencies 
that resettle uh, in our state. And actually that's soon to be four. So International Rescue Committee is coming in July as well. So Catholic Charities um, resettles, their national partner is called USCCB and Catholic Charities, that's Ava, who her office um, is located here in Des Moines. And I've got, there's some additional information about each um, agency that we're gonna get to here in just a minute that they can, that they can um, talk more about their programs. Um, Lutheran Services in Iowa, their national partner is LIRS. Um, so they resettle in Sioux City um, and in Des Moines. And then in Council Bluffs, they have an affiliate through Lutheran Family Services of Nebraska. Um, and then USCRI, which is the United States Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. So USCRI is not uh, like a federal department of the, of the federal government. It's a, a national nonprofit. So USCRI and their national um, agency is, is themselves, it's USCRI. So they have a Des Moines field office. Uh, and they also have a partnership with Catherine McCauley Center in Cedar Rapids as well. Um, the Bureau of Refugee Services is the state agency um, that bridges kind of um, the national resettlement efforts throughout the state um, with, the, uh, with the different offices and agencies here. Um, and then also Council Bluffs and Davenport actually both see some kind of overflow resettlement. Um, from offices, then Council Bluffs gets a little bit from offices in Omaha, and then Davenport gets a little bit from an office out of Moline, Illinois. Um, and then there's other major service providers, other community partners, ethnic community-based nonprofit organizations, and others that, um, that all also provide services um, to, uh, to arrivals as they come. Ava, are you able to do this one? Yes, um, what resettlement agencies do. So, um, okay, this is for USCRI. Um, USCRI offers assistance to newly arriving refugees for 90 days, which is the reception and placement program. And then they also have the match grant program, which goes up to 180 days. And that one is basically employment-based. And then they have a refugee wellness program, ready for life, legal service programs, and then the America Welcome Program. And I'm gonna ask you to do this one too. You might okay. know more about this one. Catholic Charities. Um, so we also pretty much do the same thing uh, for our reception and placement, uh, which is for 90 days. And we also have the match grant for 180 days, the vulnerable care services, which that one goes um, past the 90 days if they need more help after 90 days and it can go up to, I'm told up to five years. And then there's also the post resettlement program, um, which after the 90 days also, if they need, um, just if these like health issues still need to be addressed, if kids are not in school yet, things like that. So we help them um, in that program. We refer them on to the post resettlement program so they can finish up some of those um, issues and then the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program for um, Afghan Humanitarian Parolees. Okay, thank you. Laura, would you be able to take this one? Sure, so LSI provides a wide range of services, both uh, initial resettlement and employment services, which um, we call kind of matching grant uh, program. And then we also have extended case management. So if individuals need support after those initial 90 days um, post resettlement, they're referred for extended case management. We have a wellness program that can provide culturally and linguistically appropriate um, therapy services. And then we have um, a range of economic development, small business programs, asset building. Um, some of this, you know, with the initial placements for employment, um, there's an educational component around work readiness and kind of US workplace culture. We also help with developing resumes, um, any other kinds of supports that they may need, onboarding for, um, for employment, um, interpretation, you know, to a limited extent, um, but, you know, different ways that we can support their transition into employment. 
And we have, we also have, so like an IDA individual development account program. So um, families can save towards buying a car, buying a home towards their education. And then that's matched um, as well as um, farm farming. So global greens, which um, for, for refugees who maybe were working in agriculture before, um, they can develop that actually as a, as a business as well. And I'd add in child care training, in-home child care training. They have a great program. And Catherine McCauley talks in the next slide. It talks a little bit about it a little bit more. But I will absolutely plug this Saturday, every Saturday during growing season, the Global Greens Farmers um, have a market every Saturday morning at LSI at, three, at 3200 University Avenue. Um, also, this program was part of uh, World Refugee Day, which is June 20th, and that's a date that was designated by the UNHCR and is observed internationally as a date to just recognize and, and honor the journeys that people take um, in order to come to call Iowa home, but also the ways that they make our state and communities better for everybody. Um, and if you're, so if you're interested in learning more about that program, one of our last events, um, one of the last like culturally celebratory events, we'll have performances from um, quite a few different communities at the farmer's market this Saturday from nine to 11. So I'm gonna just go ahead and shamelessly plug that in here too, if people are interested in coming to participate and, and celebrate with us. And then Laura, would you mind um, taking the Catherine McCauley slide too? Sure, so the Catherine McCauley Center is located in Eastern Iowa, so Cedar Rapids. Um, as uh, we mentioned, they are affiliated with USCRI nationally. And so they are able to provide initial resettlement services in Eastern Iowa. Um, they also have resource navigation to help individuals navigate um, everything available in that part of the state and healthcare navigation for refugees who arrive with um, significant medical conditions. So, you know, learning how to, how to access services, which can be complicated enough for those of us who were born here and, you know, certainly difficult for, for anyone new to the country to figure out how that works. Um, they have an extended case management program as well. So for those individuals who need help after the initial 90 days, and I see we've got a question about that that we'll, we'll get back to later, um, as well as the child care business development that, um, that is uh, a similar program to what LSI is doing, um, employment services, which is again, um, matching grant, it's called matching grant program and life program, which is um, for refugee youth. So after school and summer program for uh, middle and high school age refugee youth. Okay, so what happens um, when people arrive to the United States, which is a whole, yeah, a whole a whole other conversation about how this process works and it's great to understand. So um, obviously with our humanitarian crises, I would also just preface this too by stating that, um, you know, obviously with, um, with what happens in a crisis situation looks a little bit different than what happens during regular refugee resettlement. Um, and so what this talks about is regular refugee resettlement. So typically resettlement agencies are given quite a bit advanced notice um, in terms of um, when they're gonna be receiving an individual or a family. Um, so they'll have a lot of things ready ahead of time, um, like, their, like their home, they'll have it set up and ready for them to go with some basic necessities. So resettlement agencies will greet families at the airport and actually take them to their homes that they have set up. Um, refugees received kind of that direct assistance for 90 days after they arrive. Um, so not only do they only get assistance for just 90 days um, officially, but refugees are actually re required to repay the costs of the transportation that they use to get here. 
So if you have a family that has five kids, um, that's a lot of that's a lot of airplane ticket costs that they so they they arrive in debt and have to set up those payment plans to pay back those costs. Um, so refugee resettlement agencies then help families navigate just like everything, um, all all of the things. They help them get jobs, they help them register for school. Um, they have to learn how to get around in their new city. And so they have bus trainings and transportation trainings. Um, they help them fill out um, healthcare coverage applications. They help them get to appointments. There's quite a few appointments they have to get to. Um, so they help make sure that they can, they can navigate our healthcare system, which I don't know about the rest of you, but is complicated for a lot of those who are native born as well. Um, they register for English language learner classes um, and really everything that they need to be able to lead their independent lives here in Iowa. So it's a lot that happens in that, that initial 90 day period. If people are able to enroll into that match grant program um, that Ava and Laura have talked about and that can extend some of those services to 180 days, but um, we have a self-sufficiency model here in the United States. There's a, when we first started refugee resettlement, this modern resettlement program um, in the 70s, the assistance existed for two years. There's a lot of countries in the world that still um, offer services to people for two years. Um, I think, I don't want to speak obviously for, for other people, but uh, it is my impression that most people that work in refugee resettlement would um, be very strong advocates to being able to expand the amount of time that they're able to provide services to people. But um, yeah, our resettlement agencies, I mean, they work miracles every day and carry um, a lot of responsibility on their shoulders and are, um, yeah, they work so hard and do, and they accomplish so much that you'll never see on social media or really hear about. But um, what they do is pretty incredible. So, um, Ava, would you be able to take this one? Okay. Um, how, how refugees make Iowa better. Um, they fill a lot of hard jobs throughout, um, like manufacturing jobs, food production, um, healthcare, and also food service. Um, and a lot of like the conditions, the working conditions are very, either very, very cold or extremely, extremely hot. Um, refugees and immigrants make up a large number of essential workers within the food production and manufacturing and have helped also Iowa uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. In 2018, refugees and immigrants paid um, $859 million in federal taxes um, so, um, 529 in, uh, in state and also held an additional 3.9 billion in spending power. Um, refugees also help revitalize small towns by bringing employees, small businesses, students, uh, place of worship and much more um, has been resettled into new communities. Um, they also help to diversify our state and contribute to the elements that make up our state culture. Thanks, Eva. Okay, so just some contact information for the three resettlement agencies that we talked about. Um, Rossi's contact information is on there as well. We often, we send a newsletter just for, for everyone as well. We send a newsletter every Thursday. Um, that has a long list of, of different opportunities, community events, um, job opportunities, training opportunities, funding opportunities, a lot of different things that, that are specific to our refugee and immigrant communities as well. If you're looking for, for more info or other ways to connect, but that, yeah, that, that, um, that concludes our, our presentation part of the webinar. Well, thank you, Stephanie, Ava, and Laura. I think what I want to preface before we get into the questions that were submitted in the chat is some of these will be answered in some of our future sessions for the next week and uh, the following week after that on the 7th. Um, I, I want to emphasize everyone on the call the importance of this information because I, I, 
as a, as a human being, you know, I, I think there's so much more that goes beyond that resettlement and knowing what uh, each one of these individuals is going through, what they have to go through for the next several months to years, it takes a lot of work from us um, in the community and you as employers who are willing to employ these individuals. Um, and it might take an investment on your part um, and the community that they're moving to. So I know uh, with, with rural parts of Iowa, it does literally take a village uh, to raise and grow these individuals. Um, and knowing what you know from the backstory or what they might need to be successful in the in the in the forward um, is is important. So, um, with that, I will hand it over to Nicole. She can field the questions that were in the chat. Yeah. So we do have um, several, and we're going to start off with Erin. She wanted to know when we were discussing the background checks. Um, if they are not able to bring documents like their birth certificate or driver's license, how is that handled for a, in a background check if they don't have those documents? Laura or Ava, I'm going to let you guys answer as many questions because they are the ones that work in the resettlement agencies directly and are most definitely the experts. I'm going to defer to Laura because I don't yeah, I can take my, my supervisor would have more information on that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the so for the again, this looks this is look kind of different for our quote unquote regular refugee population and then the Afghan program, right? So, for our typical refugee populations, which you know most recently has included um, a lot of individuals from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, as well as Burma and um, Sudan and, you know, other countries. So they are doing the security screening again, it's overseas before they are um, cleared to come to the US. And so they actually get their refugee status through the um, State Department or they're, you know, referred to the US program through the State Department. Um, and it includes, uh, in-person interviews, um, they do, you know, biometric screenings, they do, um, you know, for family reunification, there's DNA testing that happens. And um, yes, for some of these populations, um, especially if you're fleeing a conflict af affected area, you may not have some of these things, or maybe you never had them, you know, some of our folks, um, for example, if you're coming, if your family's coming from Burma, but um, you know, you grew up in Thailand, you don't have legal status in either country. Um, even if you were born in Thailand, it's not like the U S where you automatically get citizenship. And so, um, all you have is that kind of refugee, refugee status, refugee card. Um, but there's, there's a whole host of background checks. I'm sure you can go online and find out more kind of specifically about that if you're interested. Um, for the Afghan arrivals, the this is a is a very challenging issue right now. Um, obviously everyone who got who was airlifted out of Afghanistan, um, they were either they either had direct connections to the military, a lot of them, you know, served with the US military. That's how they were able to get out. Um, or they were parts of um, other per persecuted groups like women's rights activists or, um, you know, the press and so, or just um, kind of other minority uh, groups. And so they, uh, their screening happened once they, they came to the U.S. And it's hard now because many of them when they fled, they actually destroyed a lot of their documentation in order to get through those Taliban checkpoints. And so now making their case, you know, if they do have to go for asylum, um, that becomes very difficult. Um, yep. So it kind of depends on where they were, where they're coming from. All right. Thank you. So we'll go on to the next one. And then Kim was just wondering how employers would get connected with resettlement offices? I would say they, they can go to our website and these um, contact information. Um, for us, it would be my supervisor, Kelly Ankers. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but you can call the, the main line and you would get connected to um, the refugee program. And Stephanie, we plan on sending out a follow-up email with that information, correct? Mm -hmm. yep, yep, because it'll be part of the slides and I'll make sure that that information is included. The State Bureau of Refugee Services and also Iowa Workforce Development has all that contact as well. So if you, for any reason, are unable to, if you don't, if you, if you can't find the slide for whatever reason or that email, um, the Bureau and IWD both can get you in contact with them as well. Mm -hmm. I'm also happy, Stephanie. I mean, I can drop my contact information in the chat if that's helpful. Um, we, um, you know, LSI just started doing direct resettlement work again recently. So we're still kind of in the beginning stages of a lot of our employment services um, for new arrivals. But if, uh, if you reach out, I can make sure you get connected to the right person. And then let's see, Aaron was wondering, how often do people need support after the 90 days? And um, does that 90 days start once they're in Iowa or once they are in the US? It starts uh, when they land in Des Moines, the 90 days. That's when that starts. Um, so for the most part, they we're usually able to get them um, resettlement with everything that they need within the 90 days. So, um, but if there's anything that still needs to get done, usually then they, they can sign up for the post resettlement program and they get help after that. And let's see, Anita was asking if someone resettles in Des Moines but finds a job elsewhere in Iowa, um, do they lose those financial or um, support for the resettlement offices? How does that work if they have to transfer or move somewhere else? Yeah, and I think there's another question kind of further down to about, you know, employers who are employer headquartered, headquartered in Iowa has locations in other states. Could a refugee in Iowa be hired for a location in another state? Um, so refugees, once they arrive to the U.S., they are free to move wherever they would like to go. Obviously, um, it gets a little complicated if they leave their initial site of resettlement before some of these core services are provided. So, for example, applying for their, you know, social security card, um, you know, their there are different things that that become more complicated also just financially there is a per capita amount that we receive from the federal government to aid in resettlement, help to pay for things like housing, groceries, um, until they start working. And so if they move within the state or out of state, um, you know, if it's, if it's very quickly there, it's, you know, we can do kind of post arrival transfers sometimes to another resettlement agency to provide services but there may not be that, you know, the fi financial piece might not be there as much. Um, otherwise, you know, some of those extended case management services that are available, if, um, if you have, and I mean, we've seen this like in Sioux City, for example, um, you know, the Tyson plant um, in South Sioux City in Nebraska, they have had, um, a lot of folks, you know, move there for employment after being resettled to other parts of the state, like central Iowa. And, um, you know, if there, if there are employees that are really struggling and they came as refugees, you could certainly reach out and see if there's a resettlement agency there, there might be, um, extended case management services or other programs available. Um, but it may not be you know, as much as, as what they had available in their initial resettlement site. All right. Thank you for that one, Laura. Um, so I think Edgar, this one might be one for you. So um, we had some questions on how um, employers can get job openings um, to the job boards. Would you like to answer that one? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. 
Okay, good, good. So yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, if you want to maybe perhaps exchange emails and then maybe get in contact personally, and then we can definitely get in contact with you. Anybody from here in Iowa Works can walk you through that process on, on getting those jobs posted. Also learning about the jobs specifically, what are you looking for, the skills, the openings, the pay, etc. We can definitely walk you through that. Uh, and then and then go from there as far as recruiting support, uh, recruiting tactics, different ways that we can help you and assist you. Thank you so much, Edgar. And then we did have another one asking if refugees cannot find housing or employment within 90 days, um, what happens to them? So what's what's the next step if they're they're not able to meet that 90 day deadline? Um, for us, we refer them on to the post resettlement program uh, to help them with um, housing, employment, and also anything else that they would need, like hospital appointments, transportation, daycare, school, registrations, and things like that. And housing is usually set up before they even arrive, again, for our RMP resettlement, refugee resettlement program. And I would just add for employment services that matching grants, those services are available um, for six to eight months after arrival. So um, usually those first 90 days are heavily focused on getting all their documentation and getting the kids in school and those sorts of things, getting all their health appointments taken care of. And then, then they're referred for employment services um, and those can extend quite a bit longer. So it looks like Drew put some talking points into the chat for um, the next two series. So if everyone just wanted to take a little peek at that, but it looks like unless anyone else has any questions, I do believe that all of the questions were addressed from the chat. And I think well. if we have anything from <clears throat> the gallery, um, we do have till 2.30 reserved on Zoom if you want to ask questions. Um, you can do so now. I know, Erin, you might have another question. Yeah, no, I just wanted to um, kind of add that. So for the next series, the, the questions that Drew posted, those are going to be answered by employers in Iowa who have successfully employed refugees. So it sounds like a lot of the employers on today are, are very curious and are very interested and eager to to um, support, which is amazing. Um, and so some of those questions that people are having of, you know, how do you start? How do you do this? Um, are going to be addressed um, on next Thursday. And we're going to have a panelist of employers and community representatives who have had success in, in their efforts. Perfect. Thank you, Erin. Um, and Bill Rain, I see you're on. Uh, do you kind of want to explain a little bit about what you're doing if you want to unmute yourself and with your with your message in the chat? Yes. Well, yes. Uh, unmute myself. You don't know. You only have 40 minutes, right? So, uh, <laughs> so no, it's um, yeah, I, I started an organization called Job Rides, um, a 501c3. Um, and we have been able to provide um, rides to refugees after the 90 days have been up um, uh, for their uh, free ride to work, if you will, with manufacturing and with uh, some other firms. Um, and, um, and it's been working. Uh, there's been a, a couple of firms now, we are up to 52 refugees and we get um, uh, you know, a few here and there. Um, since then, and now we've been doing it long enough that we have refugees giving us a call and saying, hey, um, we're looking at purchasing a home or we're looking at moving. Can we still get a ride from job rides? And so that we're, we're working on that where, you know, where we can pick them up and how far off the, the, the path that they may be. Um, because this whole secondary part of the process, um, 
I'm very interested in and, and interested in, in helping the refugees for an extended period of time um, past that initial, you know, stage. And so, so if there's a, an employer that, you know, hey, how does this, how does this work? Um, be more than happy to talk to anybody about what we have set up. We're still pretty small potatoes. I have six vans. Um, and uh, not only am I helping the refugees, but uh, helping homeless and, uh, and incarcerated people get to work as well. So, uh, but uh, um, as we continue to, uh, to go about our, our mission, it's, it's, uh, it's been very rewarding to uh, um, help the refugees um, continue to go to work every day and we're able to provide transportation for all three shifts um, um, now with a couple of our uh, organizations. So, so it's, um, it's been good. So any, any um, uh, questions about that, feel free to just email me and, or, or, uh, or send out to me. I, I'd be more than happy to, to talk about it. We're just now starting our fundraising and starting to uh, get some grants and those sorts of things. Um, I'm new to the 501c3 deal. I, I just, um, um, I've been a recruiter for 29 years and I see this as an issue of people getting to work. And, uh, and so I started this and now we're, you know, now we're, now we're need, we're uh, neck deep in it. So, uh, so it's been, uh, it's been fun. So, yeah. Neil, if I may, uh... It's, it's great work that you're doing. You have a, uh, the, the, a great intention and it sounds like it's working. You're definitely meeting a great need with the populations that you mentioned, those that uh, lack the ability to have their own transportation or be nearby transportation. So I, I sent you an email with an invitation to meet. I, I think it will be great for us to meet and, and explore collaboration opportunities. Uh, there is there is a great deal that we can talk to you. So I look forward to hear from you. Yeah, you bet. No, I'm I look forward to it as well. And um, like I said, I'm I uh, I know enough to be dangerous at this point. So uh, so uh, uh, any guidance that people can provide uh, for me uh, would be greatly appreciated as well. Um, I look forward to the series and in learning more. Okay. Um, although we are learning quite a bit, um, just in the vans themselves, uh, talking to people about their, their journeys um, uh, over to the United States, it's been uh, very interesting for not only myself but my other van drivers. And uh, um, and we're uh, uh, I've been invited now to two picnics um, of uh, over 50 refugees, um, uh, where I am. Uh, uh, it's it's been uh, it's been neat. So, so anyway, as, as much as we can. Uh, I, I, I like, I like the word you use being dangerous because sometimes yeah. that's what it's going to take. It's going to take somebody willing to jump. So good, good. Yeah, yeah. definitely willing to meet. Thank yeah. you. Yep. You so I'm going to jump in here just to let everyone know it is um, two o'clock now. So that was kind of our official ending time. But like Drew said, um, we are going to stay on here for a little bit. So if anyone does want to stay on, uh, Bill and Edgar, it was requested in the chat that you put your contact information. So if you are comfortable doing that in the chat, I think uh, many people would appreciate it. Um, so we'll just kind of hang out here if anyone wants to stay on and, and chat some more. You bet. No problem. And if anybody wants to unmute themselves in the gallery, please do so. Bill, can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. Okay, okay, good. So, listen, are, are you currently covering Central Iowa, like Des Moines, precisely? Yeah, Des Moines, uh, Des Moines area. Um, um, uh, we are with our six vans now. Um, it gets interesting because uh, everybody wants people to start at seven in the morning. Well, if everybody starts at seven in the morning, um, you you run out of van space pretty quick. Uh, and so it's been, it's been neat, like with one of our clients, uh, we thought they wanted to start at 730, 
but all the refugees want to start at six in the morning. Um, and uh, once we found that out, it actually worked so much right. better for us because then we can provide three vans for six right. in the morning pickups uh, much easier than three vans for seven in the morning pickups or 7.30 <laughs> in the morning pickups. So, so just um, in communicating with both the refugees and the businesses and, and finding out how flexible manufacturers can be with both start times and end times, especially as, as we keep growing the service, there's, there's, it's an interesting, um, uh, 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 you know, quandary that we're in. My drivers and my vans are extremely busy from five in the morning until about 8.30 in the morning. And then there's not a lot going on after that. And then they're extremely busy from uh, three in the afternoon until seven at night. Um, we have to take off to get people for another um, plant for second shift. Uh, we have two drivers uh, hauling people for second shift at uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. So that's been nice. The nighttime, um, we have a lot of room to expand at night. Um, but really, we're, we're kind of in that fundraising um, stage now that we've um, kind of shown that it can work. Um, we're going to start a line into Norwalk um, uh, for a couple of companies coming up in a few weeks. Um, and so that'll be nice to be able to provide uh, transportation to work in Norwalk as well. Um, and it's all because of the refugees. I mean, really, um, I here's this need that sits out there and the math works like this um uh, basically it's uh it's fifty dollars a week per rider that we charge to manufacturers um we don't want to get involved uh in individual charges nor do we have the force i mean of vehicles or anything to do individual um what what we have found with some of our um, uh, manufacturers, um, they, they'll charge $25 a week for the ride and they'll take the other 25. They, they'll and, charge employees. And, that, and that seems to be okay with, with everybody. I mean, it, it feels like everybody seems like that's fair. And, um, uh, the problem with $50 a week is it doesn't cover um, um, uh, everything. It kind of covers the gas and it kind of covers what I pay my drivers, which is 20 bucks an hour. Um, and, um, uh, and then I don't, I don't make anything. They're, the drivers are the only paid employees we have. Uh, but it's, uh, it's one of those things where um, uh, we need that third phase, if you will, of, of, right. of another 25 bucks. And now we're really cooking with oil. So, so it's, um, it's one of those things that, uh, um, um, that we, we know it works and it's been working. Um, the refugees, my drivers absolutely love it. They're learning so much, um, from so many people, uh, and, uh, and they love the community aspect of it. Um, and uh, uh oh yeah so you know it, it's 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 a it's, it's a great opportunity because not only they have a way to go to work right and and within the employment environment they're learning their jobs the culture the language but also within the bus alone on the bus ride there's so much to learn so much to see uh, so much to, um, to, to gain from but I, I, I think that's that's where getting together in conversation can be beneficial because we can hash out ways to to make everything happen you know I, I, I started saying this last week and I and I and I've been saying a lot but it, it's really gonna take the whole village to make the village a better village you know so you have the drivers you have the events they the funding part of the funding is here but maybe we're trying to find a different ways to find the funding so that this doesn't go away mm -hmm. quite contrary we want it to grow we want it right. to grow and we want it to expand it uh, and perhaps from there share the idea with smaller communities throughout the state so they can do the same and it is not necessarily addressing the needs just for refugees or immigrants for anybody that is lacking the opportunity to have transportation available 
Wow. So, so this, this, this is great. This is definitely great. And, and I know that uh, I'm not just speaking for myself. There's many of us that, that are going to be possibly in group coming to you dangerously to talk about <laughs> exploring dangerous terrain. We are speaking of that. There's a question too um, from Eric, uh, Eric Moore. Um, Bill, uh, is job right set up to help people get to the suburbs such as Grimes and North Johnston? Or is that yeah, something you're exploring? We're, we're going to Grimes already. So we're, we already have a van going to Grimes. Um, we're in talks with a large employer in Grimes um, uh, that seems real interested in job rides, but I don't know if it's gonna become kind of a seasonal thing or if it's, it's something that they really you know, that that's really going to happen all the time. So, but we're already, there's, there's a job rides van going to Grimes to a, to a, a location and uh, that van's full. We got 11 riders. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's funny. These vans are, are, are uh, on paper supposed to hold 12 to 13 people, but uh, in reality, it, it really depends on, you uh, 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 if, if you're hauling the American diet or if you're hauling the Afghani diet because uh, uh, it can hold about eight Americans and about 12 Afghanis. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been interesting just to kind of uh, uh, determine who rides from where. So anyway, but, but I digress. It's, um, uh, we've been uh, uh, very, uh, uh, there's a suburb uh, out of the North Johnston area that has a great deal of Afghani refugees that we've been hauling for a couple of different uh, manufacturers and can do that easily because we already have that set up. Excellent. If there's any more questions, please unmute. Otherwise, there's no more questions in the chat box. Any last chance? All right. I think that's a go. Um, so stay tuned for our next session. Obviously, that will focus on becoming refugee friendly um, and then the long term success of employing um, refugees as well. So um, if you have any questions, obviously, we will try to get this recording set up on a YouTube recorded area. And I think Stephanie will also post it on the Rossi website once once that's ready. Um, other than that, contact information is in the uh, in the chat box. And if anybody has any questions, by all means, just um, connect with us. Um, and I know Edgar will be very busy in the next few weeks. So all right, everybody, have a great day. And thanks for attending.